62 will be our opening hymn this evening. We'll stand together and we'll sing Crown Him with Many Crowns. 62. Dude. 
Father, tonight we wish to give you the place of worship and reverence that you deserve. So as we are here, God, we recognize that we're not worthy to stand in your presence, but to fall down and to bow. We recognize that to come into your presence is not something which we have earned in any way but that it is something which was given to us freely because of your love because of your son Jesus we want to lift up Jesus this evening we want to say his name and to praise him we want to remember the wonderful things that you've done for us especially this time of the year when we recognize that this is the week of the year that Jesus went into Jerusalem to become our sin. For that, Father, we could not be grateful enough. But we could recognize that You are everything. Everything to us, everything we need. And without You, not only can we do nothing, but without You, we're accursed from You. So we thank You tonight. We thank You for Your Spirit, the presence promised to be in our midst, the One who not only lives in us as believers, but who comes into our services and moves. I ask that you would move freely among us this evening, that you'd speak to our hearts from your word, that the truth that we see and that we learn and understand would not only impress our minds so much so that we would see what a contrast there is between you and ourselves and be willing to put ourselves aside and worship only you. Receive our service now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing, you may be seated. Two twenty seven will be our next hymn. The cleansing wave. Oh, now I see the cleansing wave, the fountain deep and wide. The sun Lord to save points to his wounded side. The cleansing stream I see, I sing, I plunge and go, it cleanses me. Oh, praise the Lord, it cleanses me, it cleanses me, yes, cleanses me. I rise to walk in hands of light above the world and sin. With heart make your White and Christ and from within the cleansing stream I see, I see, I plunge and no it cleanses me. Oh praise the Lord, it cleanses me, it cleanses me, yes, cleanses me. Amazing grace is and me low to feel the blood of life and Jesus only. Jesus crucified. The cleansing stream I see, I see. I plunge and go, oh, it cleanses me. Oh, praise the Lord, it cleanses me. It cleanses me, yes, cleanses me. 222. 222, there is a fountain. Mm -hmm. Church of God. 
Good morning, everyone. I thought I'd pull a Luke on you to see how you like it. All right, good to see everybody here tonight. So glad that you are here. Really delighted. There's a couple things that are happening tomorrow. First of all, Mr. Michael Cross is going to be turning 29. And then also, the uh, uh, Alizé's baby shower is going to be at our house at 7 p.m. And so that's for the ladies, right, baby? Good. I wasn't planning on going. All right. Uh, then Friday, there's men's prayer at 6.30 a.m. And the teen activities this Saturday is going to be set up. Uh, our youth group is going to be set up for the big event the next day. We're just going to be we're going to have service out in the parking lot and really have a good time. So I uh, appreciate if somebody pick up that mess somebody left out there. Somebody throw a bunch of palm branches down the ground. <laughs> but, I don't know what that's all about, but I uh, appreciate if somebody take care of that. We are uh, really looking forward this week to celebrating the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And Christians, celebrate. Man, I would tell you, the world tries to celebrate everything that's evil. And they try to celebrate everything that's not God. And we who know Jesus must celebrate Jesus Christ. most significant event that ever happened in the world is God sending His Son. In realization of the culmination of the desire that men had had from the moment the first man sinned. And Jesus came. And this is the week that He deliberately walked into Jerusalem. Knowing that the end would be his death. It's a very significant celebration. Look at the Passover. Read about the Passover this week. Look at what the prophecies are about Jesus Christ being the lamb to the slaughter. And understand how significant it is that God loves you. Not just someone else, but that God loves you so much that Jesus Christ came. And you'll realize that you have so much to celebrate so much to give gratitude for. And the perspective that you'll gain will be that the triviality of the things that are occurring in life right now will just pale in comparison. You'll be able to get your eyes on the cross. What a refreshing thing that is for any believer. So I encourage you to make this a special week. You make the determination to do that. And it will be so memorable in your life. Don't forget about it. Celebrate Jesus. Okay? That's everything for announcements this evening. As far as I know, I didn't forget anything. It wasn't written down, and you know I can't remember anything, so it's not my fault. So let's pray. Uh, Father, thank you tonight for the privilege of giving in the offering. Thank you for uh, just for the brethren that are here able to assemble tonight, the privilege that we have to be able to fellowship with each other, but remembering that our fellowship is in Jesus Christ. This matter of the grace that you have given for this church to be able to, by your strength, Exercise stewardship in the offering is a grand privilege. And as we give in the offering this evening, it's our heart's desire that you would be very, very specific to us what you have, and it help us to understand that what we give is not in our strength, but by yours, but that it is a thing that connects us to the ability to be able to bring glory to you. And God, we want you 
to be glorified as we give this evening. We ask that you bless each giver, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. John chapter 15 tonight. Gospel of John chapter 15. Oh, we turn there. Refresh my memory. What's our theme? What's our theme for our church this year? Building a foundation. Oh, wonderful. I heard like several people piping up all at once. You know, that is a blessing to the heart of a pastor when your church is trying to accomplish something and the people know what it is. That's like, this is grand success. Maybe if I preach about it for like five years and everybody will know what we're doing. Uh, and of course, our, our theme scripture comes from Paul when he is exhorting the church at Rome and, Rome and letting them know that he was endeavoring in his ministry to build not on another man's foundation. One of the important things for us to know, particularly as a church planting kind of a church and a church which plants other churches, is that we're not trying to take away from what someone else is doing. Right. We're trying to reach the lost for Jesus Christ. Right. We're trying to build a foundation. To be able to do that, you have to know how. 
And frankly, most Christians are rather uh, willing and unequipped when it comes to knowing how to reach people, to grow people. A lot of it, folks, is it just has to do with the single word patience. It just has to do with the realization that, man, some seeds just sprout and grow overnight. There's the bamboo plants, you know, they just kind of poof. Next thing you know, they're causing trouble because they grew so big. You know, and then there's the sunflower. You ever plant a sunflower plant? Do it for yourself sometime. Get your sunflower seed, put it in the ground, water it. And it's amazing how that thing will just, just blow out of the ground. It'll knock anything out of the way. Uh, I've seen time lapses before of sunflower seeds and different seeds coming out of the ground. And they're, they're really fast growth. You know, some seeds just take forever to grow. And boy, they take a lot of preparation. You ever try to grow uh, a citrus plant? You notice they don't just normally pop up out of the ground. You have to kind of cultivate them. Uh, you know, one of the ways, an easy way to do it, if you want to grow your, a citrus plant, it won't be whatever it was that you're eating. It'll probably be whatever the, uh, the main strain is that it came from. Take you a uh, seed, dry it off, and then wrap it in a, a paper towel, put it in a Ziploc bag, and put it in a refrigerator for about two weeks, and it'll sprout. You'll be able to uh, get that thing growing. It'll probably kill it before it gets to a place where it'll uh, actually produce fruit. But it's just not that not that easy. And some seeds, I mean, everything, the conditions just have to be really, really right. Soul winning's the same way, and growing Christians is the same way, and uh, growing a church is the same way. It's really good for us to know our identity. You know, it's probably not going to happen that uh, in the next several months people will discover what an eloquent preacher Pastor Price is and what lovely people our members are, and they just say, you know, I just can't go anywhere else. It's the only and best probably not going to happen in spite of how nice you are. What's going to have to happen is we're going to have to reach people, share the love of Christ with them, and love them like Jesus Christ does, and help them to grow. And that's a process. And looking at them and holding them accountable to grow, looking at their lives and evaluating the circumstances, and doing what's necessary in order to get them to the place where they ought to be. We've talked about the material being the kind of material for building a foundation. We're members, and members of the material that a church is made up of. And so we talked about the different types of material. We spent quite a bit of time talking about reviewing that. And I think it's really important for us to really deal with our being the right kind of material. Uh, sometime if you ever get a chance to meet a craftsman, if you're a, a DIY carpenter, be quiet and listen to them. Talk about wood sometime. Just just be quiet. You know, to me, uh, for the most part, a wood it, it, wood is not all the same. I understand there's hardwood, softwoods, there's wood with a lot of silica in it that is from different species. But just listen to them talk about whether it's old uh, growth or new growth wood. And to talk about the cut of the wood, whether it's quarter sawn and I mean, they'll grab a two by four, and I'll be like, that's, a, that's an old two by four, and they'll be looking at it, and they'll tell you 20, 30 things about a piece of wood. And it really means a lot to them what it's useful for based on the kind of material it is. And I'm here to say this evening, we're all the same kind of material. Every one of us is the same kind of material. Uh, God saves us all, and He makes us, uh, makes us little Christs, makes us little saints, holy ones. That's the kind of material we are. Uh, but I'll tell you something, the way you're cut, the way you grow, the way you're textured, and uh, the, the quality that you present, a lot of that has to do with what's in you. And the way to determine what's in you is to go to the Word of God and see what God requires of you and add to your faith those things. So we talked about adding to your faith. And uh, this is another area uh, of the Bible where I believe it's really important for us as a church, if we're going to grow and we're going to add to the church and we're going to grow those members, this is an area where we have to really understand how to be the kind of material that lasts. One of the very, very difficult things in Christianity is just watching other believers fall off. You know, just, just seeing them just see them go away. And it's, it's just so discouraging when they go away from Christ, not, not lose their salvation, that doesn't happen, but you just see them go back and uh, not go forward serving and, and, and not do well. And boy, that is, that is very, very discouraging. 
And the most discouraging thing about it, for me, is always the reminder that but for the grace of God, there go I. That's the frightening thing. When I see somebody fall or fail or falter, the thing that frightens me about it is that it can happen to me. And it doesn't just scare me, but sometimes it discourages me. It makes me think, is it going to happen to me? Well, I'm the one that's able to determine that. But what you're made of and what's inside you is going to have a lot to do with whether or not you're going to last as the material, as the member in the church. And I want to just look at something Jesus left with his disciples. And I want to read tonight, I'd like to read all of John chapter 15. But I want to read, if, if you'll permit, this evening, simply uh, verse 11. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. And he said, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. I'll read that one more time. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. Father, please help us tonight to come to the actualization of knowing what it is to have remaining fullness of joy. We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. I memorize John chapter 15 outside of its context. I think that most kids that go to Christian school uh, or uh, have any kind of a Christian education, a lot of times John 15 is one of those passages of scriptures that you'll memorize. And I, when I memorized John chapter 15, I don't remember exactly what year it was, but when I you know, learned it, you know, I, we, for me it started with, I am the vine, you're the branches. And that's where the context for John chapter 15 in my mind began. And I think it's important for us to go ahead and put it in its context. I think that probably for me, you know, I, you can call me a late bloomer if you'd like, but I think that for me, uh, the light bulb really went on about the connection between John 13, John 14, and John 15, probably uh, within the last 10 years of my life. And, uh, you know, that's too bad. I wish, I wish it, they'd connected better. Not that I uh, went astray because of it. Not that there was any false teaching or anything like that because of it. But that I, because I never connected 13, 14, 15, really being with Jesus' last instructions, preparation for His disciples, really getting them ready for the cross. And in John 13, Jesus told His disciples, He said, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. And that is not divorced from the let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were so, I, if it not so, I would have told you. I'd go to prepare a place for you. And you have the dialogue with Thomas and the rest of the disciples and the promises that are subsequent to that. But it's really important for us to realize that when Jesus is taking this approach, or when he's having this conversation with his disciples, well, that thing about tripping me, when he's having this conversation with his disciples, he knows he's ready to leave them. He's expressly stated that he's going to leave them. And he's trying to make it so that they will make it. Now, he's going to be resurrected. He's going to walk with his disciples and teach them for 40 days the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. But the training period of the disciples, the training portion of their lives is basically over. They've had about three and a half years of intense schooling where they have literally been prepped to do the most preposterous thing which has ever been accomplished. To be the foundation for the most powerful entity that God has ever used on earth the church. These disciples Jesus is addressing in this closed setting are literally being prepared for the responsibility of going to the death about the business of spreading the gospel around the world and establishing Christ's church. Along with that will be entrusted to them the responsibility of literally being the ones who pen the Scripture. 
One of those disciples is testifying to us now in the Gospel of John. Under the influence of the Holy Spirit. What a task that would be. To write a word in God's everlasting book. And yet, the Holy Spirit used him to write the Gospel of John. And the letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And the Revelation, which is the book that ties the whole Bible together. You just look at the things that the disciples are going to do in their lives. Peter, with the audacity, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, to stand up on the day of Pentecost and preach in the faces of the people who a few short days earlier crucified Jesus. And say, and now brethren, I want that through ignorance you did it. Repent. Unbelievable. And God's Son is about to leave them. And He wants them to be prepared. So while He's giving these final instructions, it's incredible what He wants the disciples to know. One of the things He wants them to know, we read in our text this evening, His purpose in saying this is, these things have I written unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. I can't imagine the joy of being with Jesus. I can experience it with Christ in me. I can't imagine three and a half years of non-stop supernatural events. The disciples didn't get tired of it. They never tired of it. And I can't imagine, I mean, every now and again there was bickering, but I just can't imagine a better group of guys. A better purpose than to just be a disciple of the Lord Jesus. You know, Jesus did not choose His disciples to help Him accomplish His ministry. He chose His disciples so that He could train them for their ministry. I never realized that. You know, many times I thought, you know, it's kind of His entourage. You know, Judas kept the bag. You know, he was kind of the financier. And, uh, you know, Peter was the guy that, you know, said, everybody stand back, get out of the way. You know, and, uh, you know, just, you know, John was the guy that arranged things. You know, you just kind of think of these guys as a team, a ministry team. They weren't a ministry team. They were disciples that went around following Jesus, Amen. being provided for by Him, and being taught by Him, but ultimately being prepared. Their ministry didn't begin until after Jesus ascended. Well, when it occurred to me that that's the truth, but it is. And so they've got to be ready. One of the things that they've been able to have is the joy of the Lord. And Jesus said, I don't want you to lose that joy. Um, the basketball players started using joy, oh, I guess about, what, 2015 or so? Steph Curry. They used to say, Steph Curry has so much joy. He plays with joy. He grew up in a Christian school. And I think that uh, probably heard the word joy in his uh, charismatic Christian school a lot. Started using the joy. And now, if you hear uh, interviews of NBA players, they talk about playing with joy. And usually they're the winners that are playing that way. Usually they're the guys that are the champions. They talk about, you know, like, he's a great teammate. He just plays with so much joy. And I, it's too bad. I wish the word were kind of used more exclusively in, this, in, a, in a biblical context because you really don't hear people talking about joy very much outside of Christianity, do you? It's kind of our word, and I kind of want them to leave it alone. I might write Steph Curry and say, hey, listen, unless you're in church, can it, buddy. You know, <laughs> don't say it anymore. <laughs> but not... I'm joking about that. I, I, I'm, just, I'm joking about the, the entire part of that context, except I want us to, to realize that joy is something that we as Christians really need to understand. Uh, we're commanded to rejoice evermore uh, by the apostles are the ones that, you know, Jesus said, I want my joy to remain in you, and they're the ones who say rejoice evermore. Uh, we're told about mirth, merriness, and that sort of thing in the Scripture. But joy is a real source. It's a real source, actually, of strength. And I think that a lot of believers burn out, go back, and go away from following the Lord Jesus because they've lost joy. Right. You ever had somebody say, I just don't enjoy it anymore? I'm just, I'll be honest with you, I'm just not feeling it. You know, I used to just really look forward to preparing for my Sunday school lesson, but 
You know, I'll be honest with you, it's become a drudgery. It's become a task. And I don't really enjoy it. I know when I go in there, you know, I'm going to have to put up with people that don't appreciate my time, don't appreciate what I do, and I'm going to be sacrificing all these things. They have no idea what I've even done for them. And I'll be honest with you, I don't really enjoy it. Christians. You know, Pastor Price is a little repetitive. I think he forgot he preached that sermon like five times in a row. You know, if he could get off his stinking hobby horse and just, you know, come up, come up with something fresh. And we don't need new, just fresh. You know, I just, you know, or, or at least change his hairstyle. That cowlick. You know, whatever. And it's just, I just, I'll be honest, I'm just not enjoying going to church anymore. I know when I go, same person's going to say the same thing. When I say, what's up, Luke's going to say, sky. sky. When I say, uh, good evening, Luke's going to say, good morning. And I just get tired of it. I need to turn the air conditioner down. It's hot up here. <laughs> he sat in the tundra. Well, it's down. I don't know what I can do about it. All right. <laughs> it's probably my COVID. All right. <laughs> you know, sometimes believers just get to where you know. You remember, like when you when you wanted to come. I love that about kids. Man, I'll tell you, in a good church, kids love going to church. I just think that's so great. Um, I love you know, little Aria when we have her. She. If we get on Commercial Boulevard, she knows when we're within a mile proximity of the church. And she gets upset if we're not going to church. Like we, If we just go somewhere in the neighborhood around here, and she's not ready. She's like, I want to go to church. I want to go to church. And it's just, she just likes being here. you know. And I love that about kids, too. Kids just love being in church. You know, some, some adults don't even want to come. That's probably why they don't. <laughs> And I think that the reason, though, is because they do not have remaining, abiding joy. They don't have fullness of joy. Jesus said, this is how you have it. He said, I am the true vine, my Father is the husband. Man, any branch, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now, isn't it true that most sermons in John chapter 15 really park here? And really focus on, you know, better look out. If you don't bear fruit, we're going to cut you off. God's going to get you, you know. Uh, listen, this is not insignificant, but Jesus is talking about the vine and the branches, and he's talking about growth. He's talking about growing and producing fruit. Yes. And in verse 3, he said, Now, ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me. And I in you. What a wonderful concept that is. In Christ. Christ in me. And every Christian ought to analyze that and know what it is to be in Christ Jesus. In Christ meaning we have His identity. We have His name. We, as you would see a few uh, verses earlier, and as you would see at the end of this passage, even bear His reproach. In Christ. Christ in me. Literally, the Holy Spirit of God manifesting Himself in us as Jesus. When He said, another comforter, He literally meant another Christ. Another Jesus. The same kind of comforter. Do you think the Holy Spirit of God is the same as God the Son? He's a distinct person, isn't He not? Do you think that the Holy Spirit of God is the same as God the Father? No, he's a distinct person. And yet when He lives in us, He has His own ministry of sealing us, teaching us, but He's also Jesus Christ in us. So when Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, He taketh away. Uh, my, or, sorry, the, uh, my father's the husband, I should have said. Every branch in me that beareth fruit, He or not fruit, he taketh away every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may be, bring forth more fruit. And then in verse 4, he said, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. And friend, if you need to underline and highlight a litmus test for why we're ineffective, 
We're about as effective as those branches laying on the ground out there. You know palm branches actually aren't supposed to be cut when they're green. Do you know that, people? You're not supposed to cut palm branches when they're... Those were green yesterday, by the way. It's just been hot and dry. But uh, palm branches are not supposed to be cut when they're green because before they fall off of the tree, a palm naturally has all the nutrients that have gone into the growth of the plant and the branch to go back into the trunk and then go back into the new branches and go back into the fruit. Those are from a coconut palm, so a lot of the flavor would come out of the branches going back. It's actually, if you're not heavily fertilizing and doing synthetic growth to your tree, it's very harmful to a tree to harvest the branches while they're green at all. They should be completely dead so that they fall off of a palm tree. Of course, that's unsightly, and we wouldn't do that. So fertilize your trees and tear them off, and just remember you're doing the wrong thing. Okay? So um, the point I want to make with that, though, is that branches without a trunk don't produce anything. And sometimes we are trunkless branches. Sometimes we're trying to do the work outside of the church. I don't know how many people tell me, you know, I don't do church, this is my ministry. I, get, I hear that so much. Right. And uh, sometimes I challenge it with facts and truth. The church is Jesus Christ's bride. And she is exactly as described in the New Testament of the Scripture. And is supposed to function as commanded. And we are members of that church. And if you're out on your own, you're surely not abiding in Jesus Christ fact. Well, you know, I do my own ministry. I minister to people. I do this, I do that. You know, I, I, are you growing a church? Are you, is, that, is that a church? Those people that you're ministering to, is that the church? If it isn't, you're not part of it. And anything that we do without Jesus is not part of it. You know, sometimes this uh, concept of the social gospel, well, he's just gone too far just gone too far. The social gospel endeavors to be a churchless, Christless gospel. Endeavors to do humanitarian work to synthetically produce what is supposed to be organically, naturally produced by the church. You know what the problem with America is? The problem with America is we have a government instead of a church. Instead of churches. If you just come right down to it. You know what the problem with welfare system is? The problem with welfare system is that it's doing what a church should do. Right. Yes. Without the oversight and the way that you... Well, not even... It's it's just basically creating a problem instead of solving a problem. Right. Absolutely. You know what the problem is? You can just go on and on and on. You know what? You know what the deal is? Is that the church needs to be abiding in Jesus Christ. Yes. That's the problem. Abiding is the problem. And I'm thankful for unhappy people that don't quit. Because they've got a lot better chance of getting happy and being in the right place when they do. You know this whole idea that it's more noble to be a wicked sinner just so you're honest about not being a good guy? It has consequences that go with it. Well, if I'm not going to be there with the right spirit, I'm not going to be there at all. You'll be somewhere else. You'll be in the wrong place doing the wrong thing. It'll cause you problems. So bring your nasty attitude in here. We want it. We welcome it. Because it's the place that we're going to talk about abiding in Christ Jesus. And the Holy Spirit of God is going to work in that place. And that's the place that He can move again and bring to you again that longing for the restoration of the joy. Remember when David said, Restore unto me the joy of my salvation? That's what Jesus is talking about. And yet, when Jesus is explaining it to his disciples, he wants them to understand that joy is not something that has to be lost. Joy is something that can remain in you. And it remains in you by you abiding in him and he in you. Let's read down to verse 10. But man abide not in me, 
He's cast forth as a branch and is withered. The men gather them and cast them in the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Boy, that's a good benefit, isn't it? Ask whatever you want, and you're going to have it. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. Now that's a novel concept, isn't it? God just doesn't want us to be abiding in Him and be fruitful, but He wants us to be very fruitful. Friend, if we're not actually literally fruitful in a tangible way, then I think we have to look at this passage of Scripture as a diagnostic. A place that tells us, where did I go wrong? What am I missing? And I think that sometimes, not every time, there can be other things. But sometimes this is the place. You're not abiding in Jesus, and Jesus is not abiding in you. And so everything's amok. Everything's wrong. Here is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. Not here, now Jesus is not here giving them a qualifying. The so shall is not a qualifying phrase. He's not saying you qualify or you are able to be my disciples by doing this. He's saying this is the way that you're going to be my disciples. You know, in other words, when you would say it like this, okay? Uh, I miss Anthony. And one of the things I liked about Anthony was the way he walked. Remember this? Long strides, and he would strive like this. I can walk like Anthony. Want me to walk like anybody else? I can walk like Mrs. Price. You ready? <laughs> Never do that. Okay. <laughs> I really can't, actually, but uh, I like to tease my wife. All right, so, uh, so shall you walk. That's the idea. In other words, Jesus is saying, this is the way I want you to walk. He's not saying, so shall you, so shall you be my disciples. He's not saying, uh, you know, if you abide in me, then I'll let you be my disciples. Hello? <laughs> they are his disciples. Right. Matter of fact, they didn't even think they were still his disciples when they went a-fishing. Remember that? There's the resurrection, and then the disciple, Peter's like, well, I don't know what to do now. I go fishing. And Jesus came, and he's like, hey, disciples, where are you over here fishing? And he restored them, and he said, start walking. It, he's not telling them that they're going to qualify to be disciples. They are his disciples. Right. If you're saved, now you're a disciple. You're either a good one or a bad one, but you're one. So he's not saying you'll qualify, you'll get to be my disciples. He is here saying, this is the way I want you to be my disciple, abiding in me and I in you, bearing much fruit so the Father can be glorified. Now, if you, as a Father hath loved me, so have I loved you, continue ye in my love. Uh, if, if you keep my commandments... Ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in His love. Now here's a caveat. One of the reasons, one of the ways to not abide is disobedience. One of the ways not to be literally living in the love of Jesus Christ, that's the abiding term, living and dwelling in, is disobedience. Christian disobedience will just wreck you. Just wreck your life. Just, it'll just mess you all up. If you've seen it in the Bible and the Holy Spirit has said, yes, you do that, and you don't, it'll just mess you up. And it will live with you until you fix it. But we're coming full circle to John 13. When Jesus said, by, all this shall, all, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. Jesus said, These things have I spoken unto you, his purpose statement, henna, or in order that, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. That's our theme, that's our message this evening. How to have remaining fullness of joy. And it's by abiding and obeying. And here's what it looks like this is my commandment that ye love one another as I have loved you. This is how you do it. 
A believer that doesn't love his brother or sister in Christ Jesus is not going to be fruitful, is not obedient, and is not abiding. And consequently, is not remaining in the is not experiencing the remaining joy of Jesus Christ in its fullness. And I think it is so precious that God wants that for us. Fruitfulness, joyfulness. And you know the wonderful thing about brethren loving each other? You get to be loved. In other words, if I do right, I love you. And if you do right, oh, we're about to go Barney, so I've got to stop right here. But it's a great thing to be loved, isn't it? I love to be loved. You know, sometimes, sometimes I feel loved. And it's one of the most wonderful feelings there ever is. And that's the way an abiding believer ought to feel all the time. Loving, loved. It's a benefit. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. There's another caveat. We're out of time this evening. I'm not going to go any further. Because I think the, the purpose, the message this evening, is we're talking about building. And the point that I want us to get this evening is how vitally important it is for us to abide in Christ, Christ in us, for us to keep His commandments, for us to recognize our standing as a result, ultimately to be fruitful, and for that fruit to manifest itself also in the love of the brethren, And the benefits just go on and on and on. It's like a snowball. But it all begins with abiding. And the feeling that you get is the joy of Christ remaining in you and your joy being full. Amen. God, thank you for this joy. Help us to always have it and to be unwilling to live without it. According to your word, we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.